Section 14 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland the chaperone in some parts of america the chaperone is like sari gamp's interesting friend mrs harris a mere figment of the imagination nowhere in america does she occupy the perfectly defined position that she holds in europe nowhere in america are her duties so arduous as those imposed on her in older countries the idea that a chaperone for young people is necessary on all occasions offends the taste of the american it is even opposed to his code of good manners that a young woman should never be able in her father's house to receive without a guardian the young men of her acquaintance is alien to the average american's ideal of good breeding and of independence in friendship in addition his sense of humor sets down constant attendance on the very young as a bore and wearisome in the extreme a young business or professional woman dispenses with any protection except that afforded her by her work itself some years ago a young southern woman forced to earn her living and who had become a reporter in washington made herself absurd by taking a duenna with her whenever she went out to gather news perhaps it is unnecessary to say that no girl can afford to call on a man at his office except on an errand of business or charity because of these prejudices current concerning the idea of chaperonage because of this mode of considering the subject characteristically american it is all the more necessary that the line should be sharply drawn as to the occasions when the consensus of usage and good sense declares a chaperone to be indispensable the sense of the best american conventionalities broadly speaking is that a young woman may have greater liberty in her father's house than elsewhere a young man who frequents a house for the purpose of calling on a young woman should be on terms with the members of her family but it is not taken for granted that he must spend every minute of his visits in their presence or that the young woman should feel that she is acting unconventionally in receiving his calls by herself it is unconventional however for her to take with him long evening drives without a chaperone or to go on any sort of prolonged outdoor excursion be the party large or small without a chaperone driving parties fishing parties country club parties sailing parties picnics of every kind here the chaperone is indispensable no one can tell what accidents or delays may occur at festivities of this kind that might render a prolonged absence embarrassing and awkward without the chaperone any married woman may act as a chaperone young and twenty may chaperone fat and forty if the former has the prefix mrs before her name and the latter is still of the miss period it is often very amusing to hear young matrons talk of their experience in chaperoning their elders the office is one that the newly married woman likes to assume both because of its privileges and because it seems to emphasize her new dignities in consequence of the fact that the frivolous and light-minded young married woman is quite as apt to be called upon to fill the office of chaperone as a person of more responsible qualities the duties of this position are often less considered than its advantages 
to some extent the duties and the privileges melt together but not entirely when for instance a bachelor or a married man whose wife is out of town entertains young unmarried people with a theater party and a supper afterward at a restaurant or club and asks a married woman of his acquaintance to act as chaperone he expects to pay her more attention and courtesy than he will give to other guests while at the same time expecting from her an assumption of some of the duties of hostess for the occasion he may send her flowers if he chooses she must have the seat of honor in front of the box engaged at the theater and later the seat of honor at the supper party in return she must exercise her power of pleasing generally and not for the benefit only of the two or three of the party whom she likes best her surveillance of the company is of course merely nominal it is taken for granted in civilized society that young people will behave properly a chaperone is merely the official sign that the proprieties are observed she is not an instructress and is not likely to be asked to fill the position of chaperone more than once if she assumes to be her presence prevents embarrassment and embarrassing situations it should also act upon the guest as an amalgamating agent at a party of the description given her business is to mix agreeably the different elements of the company the duties and privileges of acting as chaperone in such circumstances are of so pleasant a kind that the office is a coveted one attractive women are much more apt to be asked to fill the position than unattractive ones except when a chaperone is regarded simply as an offering on the altar of propriety generally speaking the duties of a chaperone are somewhat various and more or less arduous according to the quality of those chaperoned these duties depend so largely upon circumstances that they are not easily classified it is of course the part of the chaperone to smooth over awkward situations to arrange and make smooth the path of pleasure it is the duty of the chaperone to agree without demur to whatever the chaperone may suggest on any debatable point her decision must be regarded as final a personal and individual chaperone for every girl is not necessary at a ball it is expedient however that there should be some one present who on demand can act in that capacity for her some married women with whom she may sit out a dance if she be not provided with a partner or whom she may consult in any of the small difficulties possible to the occasion if a young woman attend a ball in a company with her mother or some other matron she should return each time after a dance to the seat occupied by her chaperone and should direct her several partners to find her there in case she dances with any one unknown to her chaperone it goes perhaps without saying that the man in the case should be presented properly to the friend in charge of her the question as to whether a young man must ask the services of a chaperone when he invites one young woman to accompany him to the theater is answered differently in different parts of the country in the east a man who asks a young woman to go with him to the opera or a play often invites her mother or some feminine married friend to accompany them in the west this usage is not so common those who do not observe it are not regarded as outside the pale of good form in the case of outdoor excursions the chaperone should fix the hour of the departure to and from the place of festivity she should group the guests for the journey there and back and should designate their positions at the table if a meal or refreshments be served the duty of the chaperoned 
is in return to make the position of chaperone as agreeable as possible to defer to her in every way the favor in this case of chaperonage is conferred by the chaperone though the actions of certain crude young people are no recognition of this fact a case in point occurs to the writer when a young man and his wife were asked to chaperone a party of young people to a popular rendezvous twelve or fourteen miles from the city in which they lived the married people after much urging consented with some reluctance thereby sacrificing a cherished plan of their own going and coming they were asked to take the back seat which they occupied by themselves a seat over the wheels of the large vehicle provided during the country supper they sat at one end of the table where their presence was conversationally ignored when the time came for returning home the married man was approached by one of the originators of the party who said that the affair was a dutch treat and would he the married man please pay his share of the bill this is of course an extraordinary case but in a gross way it illustrates the lack of consideration often incident to the relation between chaperone and chaperoned that the obligation to the chaperone should be properly recognized is an important part of social training end of section 14 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section number 15 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland. The matter of dress to be comfortably and becomingly clothed is an acknowledged aspiration of most women and many men the time to be ashamed of such an aspiration is now happily gone by with some other detrimental puranical notions and we cheerfully give ourselves to the love of pretty things for personal adornment as we do to beauty in other directions that too much time may be spent in the thought about and selection of clothes is true also that extravagance of expenditure and other vices are the price of such vanity on the other hand it is as true though not so directly and obviously so that a lack of attention to dress leads equally to disaster the badly gowned woman is apt to be self-conscious not in possession of her best self and too often she carries the thought of dress exactly to the place where her mind should be free of such reflections one should not wear more than one can successfully carry off care about the details of dress should be left behind when one goes visiting or appears anywhere in public if one's toilet has been thought out and attended to properly before leaving home one's mind is then free for the entertainment of other subjects if this important matter is suggested to one only by the unhappy contrast between one's appearance and that of the people about one then unless one is possessed of a particularly strong mind the pleasure of the occasion in question is nullified the possible profit to be derived from it is cut off self-consciousness does away with the easy use of one's faculty and renders them stiff and unpliable trim appropriate clothing has a tendency to make the wearer happy and is an encouragement to a comfortable and lively temper of mind i remember hearing a humorous old clergyman say that he was frequently called upon 
to endure the recital of her miseries from a very untidy woman of his congregation and to prescribe advice therefore at last with him truth came to the surface and a thought that had long lain dormant in his mind found expression on the final occasion of her request for counsel from him madame he said i believe you would be a much happier woman if you combed your hair becomingly and put on a fresh gown oftener the matter of dress is at once serious and to a beauty-loving temperament a charming consideration to some extent it has to do with character and much to do with happiness some moralists to the contrary notwithstanding the becomingness or the unbecomingness of what one wears reacts upon the wearer and makes her distrustful or confident timid or courageous and this in a not unworthy sense if the subject of dress is important the consideration we give to it should be of correspondingly dignified and orderly character there is a happy medium between spending too much and too little time on the thought of what we wear at regular periods say at at least twice a year the matter should be taken up with some care the needs of one's wardrobe investigated the amount of money at one's disposal for such purpose be determined upon if one's purse is so large that the question is only one of purchase of consulting good outfitters and dressmakers there is still room for neat and methodical management if one's purse is small orderly and business-like management is a necessity one should study one's appearance and find out for oneself what colors what tendencies in fashion are becoming to one and resultly strike off others on the list reason not fancy nor altogether fashion should guide one in the choice of fabrics and tints one's matter of life should be considered in the selection of gowns and the appropriate thing picked out for the anticipated occasion a train on the street velvet in the morning no matter what may seem to be worn by extremists could never be in taste veils that are so heavy as seem to disguise or so ornamented that they give the wearer at a little distance the appearance of having a skin disease should be left to the woman who wishes to startle the most important gown to be taken into account is the street gown the garb in which one appears every day and before the largest number of people that one should look well all the days of the week is more important and convincing than that one should look well for the particular and infrequent occasion if one must choose between a good day in and day out gown and one of a more elaborate and decorative description the preference should be given to the tailor or street gown one would better invest in a cloth costume of good material and cut and wear this unchanged through more than one season than indulge in two or three of cheaper mold that reflect unsteadily the passing mode this gown may serve not only for the street but with various ways may develop other uses than that of outdoor wear the changes possible in accessories will make it available for calls teas afternoon receptions and the theater many women who dress fairly well in summer and in winter fail to provide themselves with suitable attire for the intervening seasons spring finds them with only a fur trimmed cloak and in early fall they are still wearing thin midsummer frocks in our changeable climate clothing of various weights is absolutely necessary to make a good appearance all fur coats are seldom suitable and for this reason should be left for those who can buy as many garments as they choose 
good separate furs are a much wiser investment for a woman of limited means white kid gloves for marketing and shopping even if one can't afford them are out of taste because out of place for a woman who goes to balls and dinners however infrequently a good low-cut gown of some description is indispensable women who have lived quiet provincial lives and are called upon to grace a wider social sphere are not always aware of this they provide themselves with appropriate gowns of other descriptions but they feel afraid of the gown made especially for evening wear they have a foolish fear sometimes of trying by this means to look younger than they are or of making themselves conspicuous in the wearing of such frock conspicuousness lies in the other direction full dress is the proper wear for metropolitan entertainments after six o'clock in the evening and full dress means a dress coat for a man and a low-cut frock of appropriate material for a woman avoidance of embarrassment means the adoption of this conventional wear a woman who has reached an age when her neck has begun to wither in front is not however an object of beauty when decollete she will do well to wear a jeweled collar or a band of velvet or tulle to the indispensable items just mentioned may be added theater gowns dinner gowns ball gowns outing costumes tea gowns negligees a bewildering variety of attire suited not only to every feminine need but answering to every feminine caprice few words are necessary to those women whose purse is equal to the purchase of all the feminine fripperies dear to a woman's heart dealers and experienced modis are always at hand to offer serviceable advice to those who have the wherewithal to pay for it though one should not take without weighing it even the best advice of this sort try to be intelligent about your clothes and to show a little individuality one this bit of counsel is perhaps in season to those who may have measurably what they choose in the way of wearing apparel preserve some sort of equality between the different items of your toilet do not have a splendid theater gown and a shabby negligee do not wear fine furs over an inferior street gown do not wear heavy street boots with a velvet evening gown arrange the articles of your wardrobe so that they bear some sort of happy relation to one another so that one article may not be ashamed to be found in the company of another so that your clothes may seem to be the harmonious possession of one person not the happy so belongings of a half dozen varying temperaments there are persons we all know them whose happy attire is always calling forth some such remark as that looks precisely like her or she and the gown were made for each other this sort of relation between person and wardrobe is the most charming outcome possible to the consideration of personal adornment it gives dignity and distinct aesthetic value to the subject of clothes let us have no more red on blondes and let over stout women leave plaids and checks alone thin girls should wear frills and leave plain tailored clothes to plumpness with the women of means this harmony need not be though it often is occasional it may be constant and if she is a person of aesthetic temperament she may gain from this happy relation between herself and her clothes a soul satisfying sense of bliss not to be gained from any other source in the world overdressing is of course avoided by women of taste 
many women who have little to spend put nearly the lump sum into gowns this is a mistake of the gravest sort the effect of the prettiest gown may be spoiled by an ill-fitting corset by gloves that are no longer fresh and by shoes that are not trim and suitable to the occasion white gloves should be white and white shoes likewise or they should not be worn the proper accessories of dress among which are veils belts ruchings and collars often give to an otherwise plain costume the effect of something chick and telling becoming headgear is of the utmost importance a hat said an apt society woman of the writer's acquaintance should bear the same relation to the other parts of one's costume that the title of a story does to the story itself this article of dress should be at once the key and the consummation of the effect intended the fashion in hats varies with great rapidity from year to year and one should be careful to avoid the extremes of style only a face of great beauty can stand the precipitous fancy slants and curves that mark the ultra fashionable in millinery if one is so fortunate as to find some time a shape that is decidedly becoming one should follow through life's general outline with modifications sufficient to conform in a general way to passing modes form the habit of putting your hats on from the back thus pushing the loose hair about the face slightly forward the plainest face is softened and beautified by a fluffy arrangement of the hair about the temple nothing is more fatal to good looks than a high bald forehead many women make a fatal mistake in their preference for big hats the picture hat is only suited to the large and picturesque type large hats make little women look like mushrooms and frequently they take away all distinction and individuality from the face beneath many a charming costume is spoiled by a failure to realize that the feet must be dressed in harmony with the rest of the costume too many women otherwise attractive in appearance wear shoes with scuffed toes and run-down heels the latter due to a bad habit of turning the foot over in walking this can be corrected easily by having the shoe built up at the sole of the opposite side by the insertion of a piece of thick leather which any shoe mender will do very cheaply one is then forced to use the foot properly women otherwise tasteful in dress are often careless and unthoughtful in the jewels they wear in gowns and millinery they would not think of wearing colors that clash and fight yet they do not establish a correspondence between clothes and jewels worn between trinkets and the quality of personal appearance they wear the contents of their jewel boxes irrespective of suitability indifferent as to season of night or day a profusion of jewels or the wearing of various and hostile stones at one time is to be avoided as the pestilence a jewel like a fine picture needs background space to show it off in the company of many other jewels it loses identity and distinction and fails in conferring these qualities upon the wearer in choosing precious stones it is a good rule to establish some sort of relation between the color and the eyes of the wearer turquoise intensifies the hue of blue eyes topaz that of brown ones and emeralds are particularly becoming to women whose eyes have a greenish tinge color is so important an element of success in every department of dress that its study should be part of the education of every woman who wishes to be well gowned the correspondence between the color of the gown and the appearance of the person who is to wear it is of more importance than the quality of the texture employed 
hue and fit make for becomingness to a great extent than elegance in material though the latter is also an element of beauty in an all-round conception of the subject a feeling for textures is rare but it may be cultivated and the effort to do this is worth making some women who are timid as to their ability to combine colors and tones plunge into black as a safe refuge or adopt a standard color which they regard as safe for all occasions this is a poor way out of the difficulty resolute study and a little experimenting will yield better results and an agreeable variety a woman should study her points in the light of day before a full-length mirror and once she has really learned what becomes her she should allow no milner or modiste to coax her into the latest cry there is no such thing as the tyranny of fashion for the woman who dresses intelligently she will never be either in or out of the mode neatness is unquestionably an element of that indefinable thing we call style though many women who are neat are not modish neatness is the integrity of dress the essential foundation to which all good things may be added to a woman whose love for dress is allied to the thirst for perfection in the branch untidiness is more than distasteful if extra hair must be worn it should be moderate in quantity of the best quality and most skillfully arranged face powder carelessly put on makes a woman look ridiculous an open placket is viewed by fastidious women as something like disgrace broken shoelaces gaps between belt and skirt soiled neckwear crookedness in the arrangement of gowns and other evidences of careless dressing are abhorrent to her neatness freshness and suitability in the wardrobe are more important items than elaboration and cost the person who suggests these desirable qualities in the manner of her attire whether she has a large or small amount of money to be expended in clothes is sure to present an agreeable appearance if to these qualities she adds a scent for novelty and style she may hope to be as far as clothes are concerned very smart indeed if beyond this she have the artist's gift she may make herself better than smart she may be beautiful one minor point the handkerchief when not in actual use should be invisible it is a concession to nature and to carry it in the hand tuck it in the belt or up the sleeve is provincial a muff or a party bag of dainty texture may serve to hide it in lieu of a pocket at women's parties in this country one sees a variety of costumes not all suited to the occasion the hostess at a luncheon may wear a white lingerie dress one of her guests will be in a short waist costume a second in white satin and the rest in quiet silks or in elegant chiffon waist and cloth or velvet skirts the picture is spoiled by this haphazard dressing the majority were correctly attired but the shirt waist and the white satin were equally wrong the hostess who knows that any one of her guests may be compelled to dress with an exceptional plainness will help to make that person comfortable by wearing a quiet gown herself except at very intimate affairs it is wiser however to decline an invitation than to make an embarrassingly poor appearance at afternoon receptions one often sees the hostess and her assistants in elaborate gowns while many of the callers are in tailored street costume this again spoils the picture if a woman expects to attend afternoon affairs she should have an afternoon gown highly polished fingernails of a length to suggest claws are bad form though one sees them on women who ought to know better 
the nail should be carefully filed not trimmed to a shape only slightly pointed they should show the pretty half moon at the base and may bear a slight polish but no artificial coloring to keep the half moon plainly visible gently push back the scarf skin at the base of the nail daily with an orange wood stick a little cold cream rubbed in nightly around the edges of the nails is a great help no sharp instrument should ever be used to clean the nails the orange wood sticks are best adapted to this purpose peroxide will remove stains suede gloves are softer in appearance and more elegant than the glacé ones but as they soil more quickly and clean less readily they should not be attempted by women of limited means a delicately colored glove is more artistic with many costumes than a pure white one but here again practicality must be counted as the light colored glove will seldom clean well as the white one does a woman must carefully consider the cost of her dressing will if she is clever plan mezzo tinted costumes which are artistic and becoming and which do not demand light or white gloves transparent blouses that display the underclothing are bad form if very sheer material is used a special slip should be worn under the blouse very thin hose are equally objectionable perfume of any sort is now tapu beyond the elusive scent of lavender or violet sachets in one's dresser drawers or a dash of toilet water in the bath one's dress at church should invariably be quiet this is prescribed not only by taste but by consideration for others who may be present and who may be of more limited means a church is of all places the one in which to avoid exciting envy by costly apparel one of the mistaken ideas held by women who are just becoming sensitive to effects in dress is that everything should match the result in such cases is not positively bad is usually dull and monotonous the woman who wears with her blue suit a blue hat with a blue feather and a blue veil a blue waist and blue gloves and shoes is a nightmare a black hat and a crew veil gray gloves perhaps in these ways relief and variety must be obtained in choosing colors the skin hair and eyes should all be considered it is an exploded idea that brunettes should cling to brown much depends on the complexion End of section 15. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 16 of Marilyn Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland Making and Receiving Gifts Wedding gifts may be sent any time after the wedding cards are issued. They are sent to the bride and may be as expensive and elaborate or as simple and inexpensive as the means of the sender make proper. An invitation to a church wedding and not to the reception precludes the necessity of making a wedding present. Indeed, the matter of wedding presents admits of more freedom each year, and many people make it a rule to send gifts only to intimate friends and relatives. Perhaps this state of affairs has been brought about by the fact that among a certain or uncertain class invitations were sometimes issued with the special purpose of calling forth a number of presents in fact for revenue only few persons acknowledged this of themselves but sometimes a bride was met who was so indiscreet or so void of taste as to confess her hope 
that all the persons whom she invited to her nuptials would be represented by remembrances in gold silver jewelry or napery the pendulum has swung as far in the opposite direction and fewer wedding gifts than of old are sent from politeness alone suitable gifts for a bride are silver cut glass table linen pictures books handsome chairs or tables rugs bric-a-brac and jewelry in fact anything for the new home is proper it is not customary to send wedding apparel except when this is given by some member of the bride's family a check made out to the bride is always a handsome gift the parents of the wife-to-be frequently give the small silver how should the silver be marked is sometimes asked good form demands that if the donor wishes to have his gift marked it must be engraved with the bride's maiden initials some persons are so thoughtful that they send silver with the request that it be returned after the ceremony by the bride for marking as she sees fit she then returns it to the firm from which it was bought said firm having received an order from the donor to engrave it according to the owner's wishes still if silver must be given marked it is safe to have the initials of the bride put upon it even should she die good taste and conventionality would forbid the use of her silver by the second wife should there be one while on this melancholy side of the subject it would be well to state that when a wife dies leaving a child and the husband remarries her silver is packed away for the child's use in future years this is demanded by custom and conventionality this rule is especially to be regarded if the child be a girl as she then has a right to the mother's silver marked with that mother's name a wedding gift is accompanied by the donor's card usually enclosed in a small card envelope as soon as possible the bride-to-be writes a personal letter of thanks this must be cordial and in the first person somewhat in this form 425 cedar terrace milton pennsylvania my dear mrs hamilton the beautiful picture sent by mr hamilton and yourself has just arrived and i hasten to thank you for your kind thought of me the subject is one of which i am especially fond and the picture will do much toward making attractive the walls of our little home it will always serve to remind mr allen and myself of you and mr hamilton gratefully yours mary brown june nineteenth nineteen hundred and five if a gift arrives so late that it cannot be acknowledged before the wedding the wife must write as soon as possible after the ceremony even during the first days of her honeymoon to neglect to do this is an unpardonable rudeness the wedding gifts may be displayed in a room by themselves on the wedding day but must not be accompanied by the cards of the donors in spite of arguments pro and con it is certainly in better taste to remove the cards before the exhibition if there are so many presents that there is any danger of the bride's forgetting from whom the different articles came let some member of the family keep a list or take an inventory before the cards are taken off some persons attach to each gift a tiny slip of paper bearing a number in a little book is a corresponding number after which is written the name of the sender the rules that apply to wedding presents also apply to the gifts sent at wedding anniversaries be they woolen tin crystal silver or golden anniversaries engagement presents are frequently sent to the fiance but this is entirely a matter of taste or inclination 
and is not demanded by fashion or conventionality contributions to linen showers may be included among the engagement gifts the fashion of such showers is ephemeral a fact not to be regretted a word or more is not out of place concerning the kind of gifts that a young man may make with propriety to a young woman with whom he is on agreeable terms flowers books candy these are gifts that he may make without offence and she may receive without undue or unpleasant sense of obligation if he be an old and intimate friend of her family he may offer her small trinkets or ornamental semi-useful articles such as a card case or bon bonnier anything intended solely for use is proscribed if a young man is engaged to a young woman the possible choice of gifts is of course much enlarged even then however very expensive gifts are not desirable they lessen somewhat the charm of the relation between the two when a baby is born the friends of the happy mother send her some article for the new arrival it may be a dainty dress or flannel shirt a cloak cap or tiny bit of jewelry these gifts the young mother is not supposed to acknowledge until she is strong enough to write letters without fear of weariness as a rule some member of her family writes in her steed expressing the mother's thanks when a baby is christened it is customary for the sponsors to make the little one a present this is usually a piece of silver as a cup a bowl marked with the child's name or a silver spoon knife and fork may be given the godparents give as a rule something that will provide durable or a gift that the child may keep all his life rather than an article of wearing apparel the guest invited to a christening party may bring a gift if he wishes to do so this may be anything that fancy dictates a pretty present for such an occasion is a record or baby's biography handsomely bound and illustrated containing blanks for the little one's weight at birth and each succeeding year for the record of his first tooth the first word uttered the first step taken and so on as well as spaces for the insertion of a lock of the baby hair progressive photographs and other trifles dear to the mother's heart all christening gifts may be orally acknowledged by the mother when the guest presents them the custom of making christmas presents is so universal that it would seem superfluous to offer any suggestion with regard to them had not the dear old custom been so abused that the lovers of christmas must utter their protest it should be borne in mind that the only thing that makes a christmas gift worth while is the thought that accompanies it when it is given because policy habit or conventionality demands it it is a desecration if we must make any presents from a sense of duty let it be on birthdays on wedding days or other anniversaries never on the anniversary of the great gift to the world if the spirit of good will to man does not prompt the giving that giving is in vain nor should a present at this time be sent simply because one expects to receive a reminder in the shape of a present from a friend a quid pro quo is not a true christmas remembrance let us suppose then that the making of holiday presents is a pleasure to simplify matters we would suggest that those who have a large circle of friends to whom they rejoice to give presents retain over to another year the list made the year previous not only will this keep in mind the person whom they would remember 
but it will prevent duplicating presents. One woman learned to her dismay that for two years she had sent the same picture, a favorite with her, to a dear friend, while another friend sent silver button hooks for three consecutive Christmases. All gifts, those of the holiday season included, should be promptly acknowledged, and never by a card marked thanks. If a present is worth any acknowledgement, it is worth courteous notice. When one says thank you, either verbally or by letter, it should be uttered with sincerity and from the heart. To omit the expression of cordial gratitude is a breach of good breeding. End of section 16. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 17 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harlan Bachelor Hospitality The day is past when the bachelor is supposed to have no home, no mode of entertaining his friends, no lairs and pen aids, and no ain fireside. He is now an independent householder, keeping house if he choose to do so, with a corpse of efficient servants, presided over by a competent housekeeper, or, in a simpler manner, having a small apartment of his own, attended by a man-servant or maid, if he takes his meals in his apartment. Oftener, however, he prefers to dispense with housekeeping cares and live in a tiny apartment of two or three rooms, going out to a restaurant for his meals. He is then the most independent of creatures. If he can afford to have a man to take care of his rooms and his clothes, well and good. If not, he pays a woman to come in regularly to clean his apartment, and she takes charge of his bed-making and dusting, or, if he be very deft, systematic, and industrious, he does this kind of thing himself. In any of the cases just cited, he is at liberty to entertain. He may have an afternoon tea or reception, or an after-theater chafing dish supper, unless he has his own suite of dining room, kitchen and butler's pantry. He cannot serve a regular meal in his rooms, but there are many informal bohemian affairs to which he can invite his friends. For the after-theater supper, for instance, he may engage a man to assist him and to have everything in readiness when the host and his party arrive at the apartment. The host himself will prepare the chafing dish dainty, and with this may be passed articles supplied by a nearby caterer, such as sandwiches, ices, and cakes. He may make his own coffee in a Vienna coffee pot. The whole proceeding is delightful, informal, and bohemian in the best sense of the word. A sine qua non to all bachelor entertaining is a chaperone. The married woman cannot be dispensed with on such occasions. The host may be gray-headed and old enough to be a grandfather many times over. But, as an unmarried man, he must have a chaperone for his woman guests. If he objects to this, he must reconcile himself to entertaining only those of his own sex. The age of this essential appendage to the social party makes no difference, so long as the prefix Mrs. is attached to her name. She may be a bride of only a few weeks' standing, but the fact that she is married is the essential. The host then first of all engages his chaperone, asking her as a favor to assist him in his hospitable 
efforts she should accept graciously but the man will show by his manner that he is honored by her undertaking this office for him she must be promptly at his rooms at the hour mentioned as it would be the height of impropriety for one of the young women to arrive there before the matron if she prefers she may accompany a bevy of the girls invited to her the host defers from her he asks advice and to her he pays special deference if there is tea to be poured as at an afternoon function it is she who is asked to do it and she may with a pretty air of assuming responsibility manage affairs somewhat as if in her own home still remembering that she is a guest in this manner tact and knowledge of the ways of the world play a large part the chaperone is bound to remain until the last girl takes her departure after which it is quite unregal for the host to offer his escort unless she accompanies the last guest or a carriage be awaiting her the host thanks her cordially for her kind offices and she in turn expresses herself as honored by the compliment he has paid her perhaps the simplest form of entertainment for the unmarried man to give in his own quarters is the afternoon tea in some of its various forms for this function the man must not issue cards but must write personal notes or ask his guests orally he may invite several friends who will supply music if he has some friend who is especially gifted musically and whom he would gladly bring before the eyes of the public he may make the presence of this friend an excellent reason for this afternoon reception after having secured the chaperon's acceptance he may write some such note as the following my dear miss brown i shall be delighted if you with a few other choice spirits will take tea with me in my apartment next tuesday afternoon about four o'clock i shall have with me at that time my friend mr frank merrill who sings i think passing well i want my friends who appreciate music and to whom his voice will give pleasure to hear him in my rooms at the time mentioned do come henry barber august the tenth nineteen o five there should if possible be a maid or a man in livery to attend the door but if this is not practicable and the affair be very informal the host may himself admit his guests and escort them to the door when they leave the only refreshments necessary are thin bread and butter and some dainty sandwiches small cakes and tea with sugar cream and thin slices of lemon these things are arranged upon a pretty set table in one corner of the room and are presided over by the chaperon who also when the opportunity affords moves about among the guests chatting to each and all as if she were in her own drawing-room if the man has several rooms one may be opened as a dressing-room in which the women may lay their wraps the men guests may leave their coats and hats on the hall table or rack when the guests depart it is pretty and deferential for the host to thank the women for making his apartment bright and attractive for the afternoon it is always well for a man to show by his manner that his women guest has honored him by her presence an evening reception may be conducted in a similar way but at this time coffee and chocolate take the place of tea or if the host prefer he may serve only cake and coffee or punch or ices in addition to the cake and coffee if a bachelor be also a householder to the extent of running a regular menage he may give a dinner in his home just as a woman might he is first engages the, his chaperone 
then he invites his guests the chaperone is the guest of honor is taken out to dinner by the host and sits at his right it is also her place to make the move for the women to leave the men to their cigars and coffee and proceed to the drawing-room here after a very few minutes the women are joined by the men or at all events by the host who may if he like give his men guests permission to linger in the dining-room a little longer than he does they will however not take long advantage of this permission but at the expiration of five or ten minutes will follow their host into the drawing-room the men who cannot entertain in his own rooms may return any hospitality shown to him by giving a supper or dinner at a restaurant or hotel in this case he must still have a chaperone if the party is to be made up of unmarried persons for such an affair as this he engages his table and orders the dinner beforehand seeing for himself that the flowers and decorations chosen are just what he wishes it is his place to escort the chaperone to the restaurant and to seat her at his right everything is so perfectly conducted at well-regulated restaurants that the course of the dinner will progress without the host concerning himself about it if however the host wishes to give an order he should beckon to the waiter and in a low tone make the necessary suggestion or give the requisite order it is at such juncture the part of the chaperone to keep the conversational ball rolling in short to act as if she were hostess the dinner over the host escorts his guests as far as the door of the restaurant going to the various carriages with the women then calls the chaperone's carriage and himself accompanies her to her home at a bachelor dinner the host may provide corsage bouquets for the ladies and boutonnieres for the men it is also a pretty compliment for him to send to the chaperone at his afternoon or evening reception flowers for her to wear but this is not essential and is a compliment that may be dispensed with in the case of a man who must consider the small economies of life of course no dinner call is made on the bachelor entertainer it is hardly worth while to suggest that the women whom he has honored make a point of soon inviting him to their homes in this day there is little need to remind women of the attentions they may with propriety pay to an eligible and unattached man end of section seventeen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section eighteen of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland The Visitor An invitation to visit a friend in her home must always be answered properly the invited person should think seriously before accepting such an invitation and unfortunately one of the things she has to consider is her wardrobe if the hostess has a superb house and the guest is to be one of many all wealthy except herself all handsomely gowned except herself and if she will feel like an english sparrow in a flock of birds of paradise she would better acknowledge the invitation with gratitude and stay at home if she does go let her determine to make no apologies for her appearance but to accommodate herself to the ways of the household she visits one woman visiting in a handsome home 
was distressed to the point of weeping by the fact that on her arrival her hostess's maid came to the guest room and unpacked her trunk for her putting the contents in bureau drawers and wardrobe it would have been better form if the visitor had taken what seemed to her an innovation as a matter of course and expressed neither chagrin or distress at the kindly meant and customary attention if then our invited person after taking all things into consideration decides to accept the invitation sent her let her state just when she is coming and go at that time of course she will make her plans agree with those of her future hostess the exact train should be named and the schedule set must not be deviated from it may be said right here that no one should make a visit uninvited few persons would do this but some few have been guilty of this breach of etiquette one need not always wait for an invitation from an intimate friend nor member of one's family with whom one can never be de troupe but even then one should by telegram or telephone give notice of one's coming if i could i would make a rule that no one should pay an unexpected visit of several days duration if one must go uninvited one should give the prospective host ample notice of the intended visit begging at the same time that one may be notified if the suggested plan be inconvenient when a letter of invitation is accepted the acceptance must not only be prompt but must clearly state how long one intends to stay it is embarrassing to a hostess not to know whether her guest means to remain a few days or many as will be seen in the chapter on the visited the hostess can do much to obviate this uncertainty by asking a friend for a visit of a specified length but in accepting the guest must also say how long she will remain an invitation should be received gratefully in few things does breeding show more than in the manner of acknowledging an invitation to a friend's house she who asks another to be a member of her household for even a short time is paying the person asked the greatest honor it is in her power to confer and it should be appreciated by the recipient he who does not appreciate the honor implied in such an invitation is unmannerly an invitation once accepted nothing but a serious contingency as illness must prevent one's fulfilling the engagement one must never arrive ahead of time once in the home of a friend the guest makes herself as much a member of the household as possible the hours of meals must be ascertained and promptness in everything be the rule to lie in bed after one is called and to appear at the breakfast table at one's own sweet will is often an inconvenience to the hostess and the cause of vexation and discontent on the part of the servants for which discontent the hostess not the guest pays the penalty unless then the latter is told expressly that the hour at which she descends to the first meal of the day is truly of no consequence in the household she must come into the breakfast room at the hour named by the mistress of the house on the other hand one should not come down a half hour before breakfast and sit in the drawing-room or library thus keeping the maid or hostess from dusting these rooms and setting them to rights the considerate guest will stay in her own room until breakfast is announced and then descend immediately if the weather is fair she may of course walk in the grounds close to the house if amusements have been planned for the guest 
she will do her best to enjoy them or at all events show gratitude for the kind intentions in her behalf she must resolve to evince an interest in all that is done and if she cannot join in the amusement give evidence of an appreciation of the efforts that have been made to entertain the guests must remember that the hosts are doing their best to please her and that out of ordinary humanity if not civility gratitude should be shown and expressed for those endeavors if the hostess be a busy housewife who has many duties above the house which she must perform herself the visitor may occasionally try to lend a hand by dusting her own room or making her own bed if however she is discovered at these tasks and observes that the hostess looks worried or objects to the guest thus exerting herself it is the truest courtesy not to repeat the efforts to be of assistance it disturbs some housewives to know that a visitor is performing any household tasks it is safe to say that a guest should go home at the time set unless the hostess urges her to do otherwise or has some excellent reason for wishing to change her plans to remain beyond the time expected is a great mistake unless one knows that it will be a genuine convenience to the host to have one stay the old saying that a guest should not make a host twice glad has sound common sense as its basis if a visitor is persuaded to extend her visit it must be only for a short time and she must herself set the limit of this stay at which time nothing must in any way be allowed to deter her from taking her departure the visitor in a family must exercise tact in many ways above all she must avoid any participation in little discussions between persons in the family if the father takes one side of an argument the mother the other the wise guests will keep silent unless one or the other appeal to her for confirmation of his or her assertions in which case she should smilingly say that she would rather not express an opinion or laugh the matter off in such a way as to change the current of the conversation another thing that a guest must avoid is reproving the children of the house in even the mildest gentlest way she must also resist the impulse to make an audible excuse for a child when he is reprimanded in her presence to do either of these things is a breach of etiquette if she be so fortunate as to be invited to a host party or a week-end party she should accept or decline at once that the hostess may know for how many people to provide rooms for such an affair one should take handsome gowns as a good deal of festivity and dress is customary among the jolly group thus brought together a dinner or evening gown is essential and if as is customary the house party be given at a country home the visitor must have a short walking skirt and walking boots as well as a carriage costume once member of a house party the rule is simple enough do as the others do and enter with a will on all the entertainment provided by the host and hostess for the party if you make a visit of any length you must not fail if you are conventional to leave a little money for each servant who has by her services in any capacity contributed to your comfort this will of course include the maid who has cared for the bedroom and the waitress by one of these servants send something to the cook and a message of thanks for the good things which she has made and you have enjoyed the laundress need not be inevitably remembered unless she has done a little washing for you still 
when one considers the extra bed and table linen to be washed it is as well to leave a half dollar for her also the amount of such fees must be determined by the length of one's purse and must never be so large as to appear lavish and unnecessary a dollar if you can afford it and have made a visit of any length will be sufficient for each maid the coachman who drives you to the train must receive the same amount there is one is glad to say an occasional household in which the idea of tips is regarded as contrary to the spirit of true hospitality in such homes the mistress herself sees that the servants receive extra pay for the extra work entailed by guests and the hotel atmosphere suggested by tipping is fortunately done away with after the guest has returned to her own home her duties toward her recent hosts are not at an end until she has written what is slangily known as the bread and butter letter this is simply a note telling of one's safe arrival at one's destination and thanking the hostess for the pleasant visit one has had a few lines are all that etiquette demands but it requires these and decrees that they be dispatched at once to neglect to write letter demanded by those two twin sisters conventionality and courtesy is a grave breach of the etiquette of the visitor hospitality as a duty has been written up from the beginning of human life the obligations of those who in quaint old english phrase guest in with neighbors or strangers have had so little attention it is no wonder they are lightly considered in comparison we hear much of men who play the host royally and of the perfect hostess if hospitality be reckoned among the fine arts and moral virtues to guest in a right is a saving social grace when ten excellent hosts are found we are fortunate if we meet one guest who knows his business and does it the conscientiousness of this neglected fact prompts us to write in connection with our cardinal virtue of giving of what we must perforce coin a word to define as guestly etiquette we have said elsewhere that the first and oftentimes a humiliating step in the acquisition of all knowledge from making a pudding to governing an empire is to learn how not to do it two-thirds of the people who guest in with us never get beyond the initiatory step the writer of this page could give from memory a list that would cover pages of foolscap of people who call themselves well-bred and who were in the main well-meaning who have deported themselves in hospitable homes as if they were registered boarders in a hotel settle within your own mind in entering your friend's doors that what you receive is not to be paid for in dollars and cents the thought will deprive you at once of the right to complain or to criticize this should be self-evident law it is so far however from being self-evident that it is violated every day and in scores of homes where refinement is supposed to regulate social usages taking at random illustrations that crowd in on memories of my own experience let me draw into line the distinguished clergyman who always brought his own bread to the table informing me that my hot muffins were rank poison to any rightly appointed stomach another man equally distinguished in another profession who summoned a chambermaid at eleven o'clock at night to drag his bed across the room that he might lie due east and west an author who never went to bed until two o'clock in the morning and complained sourly at the breakfast time that your servants madame 
banked up the furnished fire so early that the host got cold by midnight the popular musician who informed me your piano is horribly out of tune the man and wife who couldn't sleep a wink because there was a mosquito in the room the eminent jurist who sat out an evening in the library of my country house with his hat on because the room was draughty ah my fellow house mothers can match every instance of the lack of the guestly conscience by stories from their own repositories the guest who is told to consider himself as one of the family knows the invitation to be a figure of polite speech as well as he who says it knows it to be an empty form one man i wot of sings and whistles in the halls and upon the stairs of his host's house to show how joyfully he is at home another stretches himself at length upon the library sofa and smokes a cigar of peace to himself at all hours an ash cup upon the floor within easy distance a third helps himself to his host's cigars whenever he likes without saying by your leave each may fancy that he is following out the hospitable intentions of his entertainers when in fact he is selfishly oblivious of guestly duty and propriety one who has given the subject more than a passing thought might suppose it unnecessary to lay down to well-bred readers laws for the table manners when visiting yet when i saw a man of excellent lineage and a university graduate thump his empty tumbler on the table to attract the attention of the waitress and heard him from a few minutes later call out to her butter please i wished that the study of such manual had been included as a regular course in the college curriculum a true anecdote recurs to me here that may soothe national pride with the knowledge that the solicitisms i have described and other that have not added to the travel american's reputation for breeding are not confined to our side of the ocean lord and lady b names familiar some years back to the students of the high life columns of our papers were at dinner party in new york with an acquaintance of mine who painted the scene for me lady b tasting her soup as soon as it was set down in front of her calls to her husband at the other end of the table b my dear don't eat the soup it is quite filthy there are tomatoes in it we americans are less brutally frank than our english cousins yet i thought of lady b last week when my vis a vis slim pretty accomplished matron of thirty or thereabouts an admirely appointed family dinner accepted a plate of soup tasted it laid down her spoon and did not touch it again repeating the action with an entree and with the dessert of peaches and cream she did not grimace her distaste at any one of the three articles of food it is true being thus far better mannered than our tongue-tied vulgarian in effect she applied the same thing by tasting of each portion and declining to eat more than the tentative mouthful to sum up our table of rules bethink yourself from your entrance to your exit from your host's house of the sure way of adding to the comfort and pleasure of those who have honored you by inviting you to sojourn under their roof tree if possessed of the true spirit of hospitality they will find that pleasure in promoting yours learn from them and be not one wit behind them in the good work if they propose any especial form of amusement 
fall in with their plans readily and cordially you may not enjoy a stately drive through dusty roads behind fat family horses or tramp over briery fields with a hostess who is addicted to burying and botanizing but go as if they were the exact bent of taste and desire a dinner party made up of men who talk business and nothing else and their overdressed wives who revel in the discussion of what mrs sure recalls the three dreadful d's disease dress and domestics may typify to you the acme of boredom comport yourself as if you were in your native element and happy there the self-discipline will be a means of grace in more years than one on sunday accompany your host to their place of worship with the same cheerful readiness to like what they like you may be a higher church episcopalian and they belong to the broadest wing of unitarians or the straightest sect of evangelicals put prejudice and personal preference behind you and find consolation in the serene conviction of guestly duty done and done in a true christian spirit end of section eighteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number nineteen of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c marion harlan's complete etiquette by marion harlan the visited it has been said and with an unfortunate amount of truth that the gracious old-fashioned art of hospitality is dying out those who keep an open house from year's end to year's end from whose doors the latch string floats in the breeze ready for the fingers of any friend who will grasp it are few the entertaining that is done now does not compensate us for the loss of what may be called the latch-string out custom of the days gone by luncheons teas dinners card parties receptions and the like fill the days with engagements and hold our eyes walking until the morning hours but this is a kind of wholesale hospitality as it were and done by contract such affairs remind one ludicrously of the irreligious and historic farmer boy who reminiscent of his father's long-winded grace before meat suggested when they salted the pork for the winter that he say grace over the whole barrel and pay off a disagreeable obligation all the same perhaps if our hostess were frank she would acknowledge a similar desire when she sends out cards by the hundreds and fills her drawing-rooms to overflowing with guests scores of whom care to come even less than she cares to have them but there seems to be a credit and debit account kept and once in so often it is incumbent on, on the society woman to give something florists and caterers are called to her aid and with waiters and assistants hired for the occasion take the work of preparation for the entertainment off my lady's hands in speaking of hospitality in the chapter we refer especially to the entertaining of a visitor for one or many days in the home not long ago we made a point of asking several housekeepers why they did not invite friends to visit them three out of four interviewed on the subject agreed that the servants were the main drawback the fourth woman who is in moderate circumstances confessed that she did not want guests unless she could entertain them handsomely to alleviate the first-mentioned difficulty every housekeeper should 
while engaging a servant declare boldly that she receives her friends at will in her home and have that fact understood from the outset of bridget's or gretchen's career with her at the same time she should remember that extra work should mean extra pay or its equivalent in help it is astounding how inconsiderate many women otherwise kindly are in their relation to domestic servants as to the reason given by the fourth housekeeper it is too contemptible to be considered by a sensible woman our guests come to see us for ourselves not for the beauty of our houses or for the elegance of our manner of living the woman whose house is clean and furnished as her mean spirit permit who sets her table with the best that she can provide for her own dear ones is always prepared for company there may be times when the unlooked for coming of a guest is an inconvenience it should never be the cause of a moment's mortification only pretense and seeming to be what one is not need cause a sensation of shame if a friend comes put another plate at the table and take him into the sanctum sanctorium the home with such a welcome the simplest home is dignified but as to the invited guest the hostess knows when she wishes to receive her friend and in a cordial invitation states the exact date upon which she has decided giving the hour of the arrival of trains and saying that she or some member of her family will meet the guest at the station one who has ever arrived at a strange locality unmet knows the peculiar sinking of heart caused by the neglect of this simple duty on part of the hostess the letter of invitation should also state how long the visitor is expected to stay this may be easily done by writing will you come to us on the twenty first and stay for a week or we want you to make us a fortnight's visit coming on the fifteenth if one can honestly add to an invitation we hope that you may be able to extend the time set as we want to keep you as long as possible it may be done if not meant the insincere phrase is inexcusable elaborate preparations should be avoided preparations that weary the hostess and try the tempers of servants the guest chamber will be clean sweet and dainty no matter how competent a chambermaid is the mistress must see for herself that sheets pillow slips and towels are spotless and that there are no dusty corners in the room a trustworthy thermometer should hang in full view that the guests may regulate it by the temperature of her room if the visitor be a woman and flowers are in season a vase of favorite blossoms will be placed on the dressing table the desk or writing table will be supplied with paper envelopes pen ink stamps and a calendar several interesting novels or magazines should be within reach all these trifles add to the home-like feeling of the new arrival a welcome should be cordial and honest a hostess should take time to warm her guest's heart by telling her that she is glad genuinely glad to have her in her home she should also do all she can to make the visitor forget that she is away from her own house all this done the guest should be let alone we mean this strange as it may seem many well-meaning hostesses annoy guests by following them up and by insisting that they shall be doing something all the time this is almost as wearing and depressing as neglect would be each person wants to be alone a part of the time a visitor is no exception to this rule she has letters to write or an interesting book she wants to read or if she needs the rest and change her visit should bring her it will be luxury to her to don a kimono and relax on the couch or bed in her room 
for an hour or two a day the thought that one's hostess is noting and wondering at one's absence from the drawing-room where one is expected to be on exhibition is to a nervous person akin to torture allow all possible freedom as to the hour for rising provide a certain amount of entertainment for the visitor in the way of outdoor exercise if she likes it callers amusements and so forth and then again in plain english let her alone one must never insist that a guest remain beyond the time set for her return if the guest declares sincerely that to remain longer is inadvisable to speed the parting guests is an item of true hospitality the hostess may beg her to stay when she feels that the visitor can conveniently do so and when her manner shows that she desires to do so but when the suggestion has been firmly and gratefully declined the matter should be dropped a guest who feels that she must return to her home for business family or private reasons is embarrassed by the insistence on the part of her entertainers that such return is unnecessary of course the visitor in one's house should be spared all possible expense the porter who brings the trunk should be paid by the host unless the guest forestalls him in his hospitable intention car fares hack hire and such things are paid by the members of the family visited all these things should be done so unobtrusively as to escape if possible the notice of the person entertained if a woman have two maids the second maid should shortly before the retiring hour go to the guest room turn down the covers of the bed and provide a picture of fresh drinking water in the event of having one maid only the hostess will perform these offices herself no matter what happens should there be illness and even death in the family a hospitable person will not allow the stranger within her gates to feel that she is in the way or her presence an inconvenience there is no greater cruelty than that of allowing a guest in the home to feel that matters would run more smoothly were she absent only better breeding on the part of the visitor than is possessed by her hostess will prevent her leaving the house and returning to her home should sudden illness in the family occur the considerate person will leave but this must be permitted only under protest to invite a friend to one's house and then seem to find her presence unwelcome is only a degree less cruel than confining a bird in a cage where he can not forage for himself and slowly starving him if one has not the hospitable instinct developed strongly enough to feel the right sentiment let him feign it or refuse to attempt to entertain friends the person under one's roof should be for the time sacred and the host who does not feel this is altogether lacking in the finer instincts that accompany good breeding we know one home in which hospitality is dispensed in a way no guest ever forgets from the time the visitor enters the doors of the house beautiful she is as it were enwrapped in an atmosphere of loving consideration impossible to describe one guest visiting there with her children was horrified at their being taken suddenly ill with gripe so ill that to travel with them just then was dangerous she was hundreds of miles away from home with the possibility of the children's being confined to the house for some days to come the physician summoned confirmed her fears the distressed mother knew only too well what an inconvenience illness is especially in a friend's house instead of in one's own home all the members of the household united in making the disconcerted woman feel that this home was one and only place in which the little ones should have been seized 
with the prevailing epidemic that it was a pleasure to have them there under any circumstances that to wait on them and their mother was a privilege the sweet-voiced sweet-faced hostess herself an invalid at the time drew the anxious visitor down on the bed beside her and kissed her as she said dear child try to believe that you and yours are as welcome here as in your own dear mother's home surely of such is the kingdom of heaven end of section 19 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 20 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Daniel, New York City. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harlan. Chapter 20 Hospitality as a Duty. If ours were a perfect state of society, constructed on the Golden Rule, animated and guided throughout by unselfish love for friend and neighbor and charity for the needy there would be no propriety in writing this chapter home domestic comfort and happiness being our earthly possessions we would be eagerly willing to share them with others as society is constructed under a state of artificial civilization and as our homes are kept and our households are run the element of duty must interfere or hospitality would become a lost art even where the spirit of this one of the most venerable of virtues is not wanting conscience is called in to regulate the manner and the seasons in which it should be exercised as a cornerstone assume once for all that a binding obligation rests on you to visit and to receive visits and to entertain friends acquaintances and strangers in a style consistent with your means at such times as may be consistent with more serious engagements having once issued an invitation you are sacredly bound on the day named to give yourself completely to your guests to invite people to dinner and then ask them to leave early in order that one may accept an invitation that one has received in the meantime would seem impossible to a woman of right instincts but it has been done at least by women of social prominence it may sound harsh to assert that you have no right to accept hospitality for which you can never make any return in kind the principle is nevertheless sound to the core those who read the newspapers forty years ago will recall a characteristic incident in the early life of colonel ellsworth the brilliant young lawyer who was one of the first notable victims of the civil war his struggles to gain a foothold in his profession were attended by many hardships and humiliating privations. Once, finding the man he was looking for on a matter of business in a restaurant, he was invited to partake of the luncheon to which his acquaintance was just sitting down. Ellsworth was ravenously hungry, almost starving, in fact, but he declined courteously but firmly, asking permission to talk over the business that had brought him thither while the other went on with the meal. The brave young fellow, in telling the story in after years, confessed that he suffered positive agony at the sight and smell of the tempting food. I could not, in honor, accept hospitality I could not reciprocate, was a simple explanation of his refusal. I might starve, I could not sponge. Sponging, to put it plainly, is pauperism. The one who eats of your bread and salt becomes, in his own eyes, not in yours, your debtor. For the genius of hospitality is to give, not expecting to receive again. This, by the way. I do not mean if your wealthy acquaintance invites you to a fifteen-course dinner, the cost of which equals your monthly income, that you are in honor or duty bound to bid her an entertainment as elaborate, or that you should suffer in her estimation, or by the loss of your self-respect. But by the acceptance of the invitation, you bind yourself to reciprocation of some sort. If you can do nothing more, ask your hostess to afternoon tea in your own house or flat and have a few congenial spirits to meet her there it is the spirit in such a case that makes alive and keeps alive the genial glow of goodwill and cordial friendliness the letter of commercial obligation like for like in degree and not in kind 
would kill true hospitality. Your friend's friend, introduced by him and calling on you, has a proved claim on your social offices. If you cannot make a special entertainment for him, ask him to a family dinner, explaining that it is such, and make up in kindly welcome for the lack of lordly cheer. If it be a woman, invite her to luncheon with you, and a friend or two, or to a drive, winding up with afternoon tea in some of the quietly elegant tea rooms that seem to have been devised for the express use of people of generous impulses and slender purses. It is not the cost in coin of the realm that tells with the stranger, but the temper in which the tribute is offered. I do not entertain in the sense in which the word is generally used, wrote a distinguished woman to me once, hearing that I was to be in her neighborhood. But I cannot let you pass me by. Come on Thursday and lunch with me, and tete-a-tete. -tete. I accepted gladly, and the memory of that meal, elegant in simplicity, shared with one whom my soul delights to honor, is as an apple of gold set in a picture of silver. The stranger, as such, has a scriptural claim on you, when circumstances make him your neighbor. In thousands of homes since the day when Abraham ran from his tent door to constrain the thirsting and the hungering travelers to accept such rest and refreshment as he could offer them during the heat of the day, angels have been entertained unawares in the guise of strangerhood. Did you know the bees before they came to our town? asked an inquisitive New Englander of her near neighbors. No. Then you won't mind me asking you, why did you invite them to dinner on Thanksgiving Day? It's made a deal of talk. Abraham's disciple smiled. Because they were strangers and seemed to be lonely. They are respectable, and they live on my street. Poetical justice requires me to add that the bees, who became the lifelong friends of their first hostess in the strange land, proved to be people of distinction, whom the best citizens of the exclusive little town soon vied with one another in cultivating. In ignorance of their antecedents, the imitator of the tent-holder of Mamre did her duty from the purest of motives. Not one individual or family has a moral or social right to neglect the practice of hospitality. Unless one is confined to the house or bed by illness, one should visit and invite visits in return. We are human beings, not hermit crabs. End of section 20. Recording by David Daniel, New York City. Section 21 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Langston. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland. The House of Mourning. The observance of mourning is a difficult matter to treat, for individual feeling enters largely into the question. Still, there are certain rules accepted by those who would not be made remarkable by their scorn of conventionalities. The matter of mourning cards and stationery has been treated in the chapter on calls and cards and on letter writing. A word may here be added with regard to the letter of condolence. This should be written to the bereaved person as soon as practicable after the death for which she mourns. It must not be long, but should express in a few sincere words the sympathy felt and the wish to do something to help alleviate the mourner's distress. This letter does not demand an answer, but some persons try, some weeks after such letters have been received, to reply to them. This is not really necessary, except when the writer is a near friend of the family. In many cases, a black-edged card bearing the words, Mr. and Mrs. Dash Dash wish to thank you for your kind sympathy in their recent bereavement is mailed to the writer. If one does not write a letter, one may send to or leave at the house of mourning a card bearing the words, Sincere Sympathy, upon it. Attending a Funeral the funeral notice in the daily papers is now sometimes accompanied by the request, kindly omit flowers. To send flowers after the appearance of such a notice is the height of rudeness and shows little respect to the dead and none for the family. If there are more flowers than can be taken to the cemetery, those left may be sent to the inmates of hospitals who need not know that they were intended for a funeral. Those who attend a funeral should dress quietly, but they need not wear black unless they prefer to do so. 
while few persons would be guilty of attending a funeral out of curiosity there are undoubtedly some who do sensitive people are growing to realize that the last ceremony for the dead is too sacred to be shared except with those who are really entitled by close ties to be present and have signified by personal messenger those whom they desired should be present in attending a funeral one should be prompt and yet not so far ahead of the hour set as to arrive before the final arrangements are completed at a church or house funeral one should wait to be seated as the undertaker or his assistant directs nor should one ever linger after the services to speak to any members of the family unless one is particularly requested to do so one should not expect to look on the face of the dead unless one is asked to do so closing the casket in churches of two denominations it is not customary to have the coffin opened to the public gaze it is a pity that this law is not universal but it is becoming more common to have the casket left closed through the entire service it certainly spares the mourners the agonizing period during which the long line of friends and strangers who come from vulgar curiosity file past and look on the unshielded features of the dead some one has said that the custom of allowing the curious who did not know the deceased and who cared nothing for him to gaze on his face after death seems to be taking an unfair advantage of the dead many persons prefer a quiet house funeral for one they love for there are few persons vulgar or bold enough to force themselves into the house of mourning where only those who knew and loved the departed are welcome but the method of personal invitation makes the presence of such people impossible at a house funeral the clergyman stands near the head of the coffin while he reads the service the audience standing or sitting as the custom of the special service used demands the church funeral at a church funeral the clergyman meets the coffin at the door and precedes it up the aisle reading the burial service as he begins to read the congregation rises and stands as the procession moves forward when after the services the coffin is lifted by the bearers the congregation again rises and remains standing until the casket has been taken from the church a private interment or one at the convenience of the family is now almost universal unless invited no outsider even if he be a friend of the family will go to the cemetery under such circumstances after the funeral and when one's friends have begun to realize sorrow is at the time when it is the hardest to bear it is then that the sympathetic person may do much toward brightening the long and dreary days in the house of mourning flowers left at the door occasionally frequent calls an occasional cheering note a bright book lent are a few of the small courtesies that amount to actual benefactions only those who have had to learn to live with a grief that is almost forgot by others know what such tokens of thoughtful sympathy mean all who count themselves friends should call within a month always telling the maid that if the ladies do not feel like appearing they are not to do so a widow's dress the heaviest mourning demanded by conventionality is worn by a widow but even she is now allowed to dispense with the heavy crape veil in its place is the long veil of nuns veiling which is worn over the face only at the funeral with it is a face veil trimmed with crape and a white ruche or widow's cap stitched inside of the rim of the small bonnet the dress is of henrietta cloth or other lustreless material and may be trimmed with crape black suede gloves and black bordered handkerchiefs if these are like are proper the widow seldom discards her veil under two years some widows wear it always after the first year it is shortened it is a matter for congratulation that crape that most expensive unwholesome perishable and inartistic of materials is worn less and less with each passing year surely to have to wrap one's self in its stiff and malodorous folds adds discomfort to grief it is now seldom worn except by widows although a daughter may wear it for a parent a mother for her child the matter of the mourning veil is one each person must settle for herself although the strictest followers of fashion deprecate its use for any women except widows some bereaved daughters and mothers wear it but not for a long period seldom longer than six months mourning for the members of one's immediate family may be worn for a year then lightened mourning for a relative-in-law is lightened at the end of three or six months incongruous mourning while on this subject it would be well to call attention to the fact that one should either wear conventional black or no black at all for a widow to wear as a well-known woman did recently 
a long veil and gray suede gloves borders on the ridiculous nor should velvet cut jet satin and lace be donned by those wearing the insignia of grief nor are black and white combined deep mourning they may be worn when the weeds are lightened but not when one is wearing the strictly conventional garb of dolor even widows may wear all white but not with black ribbons unless the heavy black has been laid aside for what may be called the second stage of bereavement at first all materials either in black or white must be of dull finish dresses may be of nun's veiling henrietta cloth and other unshining wool fabrics or of dull lustreless silks simple white muslins lawns and mulls are proper but must not be trimmed with laces or embroidered mourning for men for men black or gray suits black gloves and ties and a black band upon the hat are proper the tie should be of taffeta or grosgrain silk not of satin or figured silk i would lay a special stress on the poor taste of the recent fad of wearing a black band upon the sleeve of a colored coat the same rule applies to the would-be smart young woman who sports a narrow black strip upon the left arm of her tan raincoat or walking jacket if she cannot wear conventional and suitable mourning she would better wear none judging the bereaved the matter of the period of time in which a mourner should shun society is a subject on which one may hesitate to express an opinion as there are too many persons whose views would not coincide with ours in this case as in others one must to a certain extent be a rule unto oneself one who is very sad shrinks naturally from going into gay society for the first few months after bereavement the contrast of the gaiety with the mourner's feelings must of necessity cause her pain to such a one we need suggest no rules to those less sensitive or less unhappy it would be well to say that deep black and festive occasions do not form a good combination while one wears crape and a long veil one should shun receptions opera boxes teas and all such places later as one lightens one's morning one may attend the theatre small functions and informal affairs even the very sad may go to the theatre when they would shrink from attending an affair at which they would meet strangers and where they would be obliged to laugh and be gay after the first few months of the conventional retirement are past the sufferer must decide for herself what she may and may not do we would add rather as a suggestion than as a law of etiquette that the onlooker forbear to judge of the behavior of the recently bereaved the heart knoweth its own bitterness and if that bitterness can be sweetened by some genial outside influence let others hesitate to condemn the owner of the heart from seeking that sweetness those whom we have lost if they were worth loving would be glad to know that our lives were not all dark the seemly custom followed in france of sending to relatives and friends of the family a letter advising them of a death is not unfortunately known in this country where we with less propriety advertise our griefs and our gaieties alike in the public prints End of section twenty one recording by laura langston